Welcome to a new webinar by the USME Center. In this webinar, we're going to discuss the new foreign investment law, which will be presented by Jan Oltheis. Before proceeding with today's topic, I would like to briefly introduce the USME Center. The USME Center is a project funded by the European Union in 2010 and supports European small and medium enterprises to get ready to do business in China. We are currently in our second phase of activities and we are going to run our services until July 6, 2019. This webinar is implemented by one of our implementing partners, the Benelux Chamber of Commerce, which is the most active Benelux business platform in China. It is the only Chamber of Commerce officially recognized and supported by all three Benelux embassies in China. Bencham currently has over 250 members and its base consists of large enterprises, small medium-sized enterprises and individuals with an active interest in developing their business in China. For more information about the activities of Bencham, you can visit their website that you can see here on the screen. Today's speaker is Jan Oltais. He's a partner at Buren and has been active in China since 1995. Jan is a registered arbitrator at the China International Economic Trade Arbitration Commission and at the Shanghai International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission. So this webinar will deal will have a subject, the foreign investment law, which is uh, very recently. Uh, adopted by the National People's Congress. Um, in this case, uh, my webinar subjects will have a certain order, which I will uh, explain now. First, I will give you a brief introduction. Uh, then, I will like to uh, deal with the encouragement of foreign investment in China and why the foreign investment law is having as aim the encouragement of foreign investment and uh, thereafter the protection of foreign investment and then the expect expected upcoming changes in practice and then I come to a conclusion. I have some sheets which you might find helpful uh, to look at during this uh, webinar uh, exercise uh, and it might things make things more organized. About the introduction uh, of the foreign investment law. First, uh, it is the first unified law aimed at regulating uh, foreign investment. Uh, you might know that in the past foreign investment was regulated in specific laws in order to contain or at least regulate specifically foreign investment, which was the foreign investment uh, law for, for, for joint ventures, uh, the holy foreign owned enterprise uh, law and the contractual joint venture law. These laws will eventually be uh, re uh, stopped and replaced by one unified investment law. It's called the Foreign Investment uh, Law 2020. Um, it was passed by the National People's Congress on the 15th of March and uh, that is very recent, nobody expected it would go this uh, fast uh, because it had only two reviews uh, and normally you will have three reviews. Uh, I will come back to that uh, later. It will come into effect on the 1st of January 2020 and it has a transit period of five years. So coming back to uh, why it was uh, passed so swiftly. Um, only two uh, review rounds. Uh, it's generally accepted that it is related to the US-China trade war developments. Uh, you might know that uh, the US and also the EU have uh, a long record of challenging China uh, with lack of protection of intellect intellectual property rights and also accusations of forced technology transfer uh, policies. Uh, this has put China and the US on loggerhead with each other and the foreign investment law might clarify the position on China, at least on paper, uh, that it is willing to uh, protect intellectual property and foreign investment. The National 
People Congress spokesman Zhang Yesui uh, has indicated that it is in the interest of China and the United States uh, who are deeply interwoven uh, and that a uh, confrontational US-China relationship does not benefit anyone. So China has a clear policy towards its relationship with the US which should be based on non-conflict and non-confrontation, mutual respect and win-win cooperation. But as you might know, uh, the trade war may have caused policymakers uh, to include uh, specific precautions. That means extensive national security clauses that were applicable in the uh, past, still applicable and might come into effect in a broad sense after 2020. In news, in new regulatories, and uh, discriminatory measures against uh, Chinese investors uh, uh, that might lead China to take corresponding measures against uh, the foreign companies in China. I will get back to that uh, later. The reach of the foreign investment law. Uh, the foreign investment law applies to any foreign investment within the territory of the People's Republic of China. And foreign investment is referred to as any direct or indirect investment activity of foreign enterprises, organizations or natural persons, including the setup of FIEs, that means foreign invested enterprises, the acquisition of shares, equities, similar rights in Chinese enterprises, and investment in new projects and other investment forms set by the State Council. Although in this respect the foreign investment law does not mention uh, variable investment enterprises, this might still be covered in future laws and regulations. So if you compare the 2015 first draft and then the second review in 2019 of the foreign investment law, it is very interesting to see that uh, in the 2015 version, the FIE uh, were included in foreign investment, uh, but they were not included in the version that now has passed, because maybe it was considered too controversial to do so, and a special regime on actual control instead of legal, uh, legal control uh, might follow later in Chinese policies. In the 2015 version also there was no firm prohibition of forced technology transfers incorporated in that version but it is in the 2019 version. This has most likely to do with the uh, uh, complaints made by the EU and the US before the World Trade Organization that China's regime is having a policy of forced technology transfer. In the 2015 version there is also no antitrust uh, review um, but in the 2018 and 19 version there is an antitrust review required when foreign investors require, uh, acquire f uh, stakes in, uh, in strategic uh, industries. And there is no mention of a reporting system in 2015, while in the 2018 and 19 version there is a very clear information reporting system. If you compare these two versions of the uh, first draft in 2015 and 2019 and then you will see that in the 2015 there were enormous chapters on access uh, of, uh, to the administration. There were 27 articles on national review and uh, there were importing, uh, reporting, uh, inf information reporting uh, uh, articles. Uh, these are now uh, in the 2019 version greatly reduced. So the articles in total uh, in 2015 were 170. In the 2019 version only 42. That looks like if all uh, 
parts of the 2015 version that were uh, compromising or uh, not sufficiently detailed or there were uh, no agreement within the um, uh, within the government on whether to put them in or not put them in they have kept them out in order to make sure that the law could pass more swiftly next chapter of the webinar encouragement of foreign investors so the big and important part of the foreign investment law is the principle of national treatment and uh, the negative list. They should, uh, in addition, uh, secure a level playing field for foreign investors in China. And it should open up and facilitate foreign investment. Uh, most likely, the reason for all this opening up is also to keep China at an attractive investing uh, territory, in particular uh, for innovative technologies. So let me first discuss national treatment and the negative list. So there is a pre-establishment national treatment that would imply that foreign investors and their investors and their investments shall be granted the treatment no less favorable than that granted to domestic investors and their investments in the face of market access evaluation. So when coming to the uh, Chinese market, the first access uh, regulatory and registrations should not impose unfair, and, um, unfair treatment with respect to domestic uh, enterprises. In, in, this would only um, uh, deviate in the event of the negative list. The negative list are industries uh, in the Chinese economy that are considered strategic and where foreign investment is not uh, fully uh, open. So there remain to be spe special administrative measures for access of foreign investment in specific industries as stipulated by the state. So the state shall grant national treatment to foreign investments that are not in the negative list. So foreign investments shall not invest in any industries prohibited by the negative list for foreign investment market access. And foreign investors shall meet investment requirements specified in the negative list of any industries restricted by the negative list for foreign investment market access and industries that are not covered in the negative list for foreign investment market access shall be assessed uniformly by domestic and foreign investment. On the other hand, the, keys, the key industries encouraged for the opening up include modern agriculture, advanced manufacturing, high technology, modern service industries, among which the automotive manufacturing, software and the information technology services. Uh, and they have a relatively higher degree of open, openness. This is not stated in the foreign investment law, but the system that certain industries are considered uh, strategic and therefore should not be completely open to foreign investment remains in place. On all the other areas in the economy, national treatment shall apply to foreign investors and they shall have an equal playing field with domestic investments. So the level playing field, that means what does it imply? It means the promotion of foreign investment enterprises, equal participation in formulating standards and the fair participation in government procurement. Uh, there are several articles in the foreign investment law that support this part. So you have Article 9 that uh, indicates policies in support of enterprise development shall apply equally to foreign invested enterprises. These are new articles. And the state shall protect the right of foreign funded enterprises equally, that they equally participate in the setting of standards 
and reinforces the information disclosure and social supervision of this for the setting of standards. Um, and if there are compulsory standards set by the Chinese state, they shall equally apply to foreign funded enterprises. That's all in Article 15. And then an important article for the uh, EU SME enterprises is that there should be fair competition in foreign invested enterprises to participate in government procurement activities. Up to now the government procurement and tendering has always been very, I think, in main, in often been very unclear in practice. So uh, this at least, this article 16 in the foreign investment law will make it clear that there should be fair competition and eventually also transparency in government procurement. Then Article 30 is saying that where foreign investors intend to invest in industries or fields that are subject to license according to law, the relevant licensing formality shall be completed according to the present law. Uh, Unless otherwise stipulated under the laws and administrative regulations, relevant competent departments shall review the licensing applications filed by foreign investors under the same conditions and procedures as those for, foreign, for domestic investment. So foreign investment enterprises shall be able, according to the principles in this foreign investment law, to participate in the uh, Chinese market on a level playing field. Then, um, the, let, I would like to discuss the opening up and the facilitating of foreign investment. Uh, foreign invest investors are encouraged and guided to invest in specific industries, fields and regions. Uh, foreign investors and FAEs shall enjoy preferential treatment according to the laws. Also, the local government might apply and develop foreign investment promotion and facilitation policies. This is all regulated in the foreign investment law. So, that means that if foreign investors would um, get favorable treatment according to local policy and measures, they should be able to rely on these policies and measures and they should not be withdrawn in a later stage as soon as the investments are being made. Uh, on a special note, I want to say here that uh, this is not self-evident and there might be criticism on this uh, part. At least it might say, uh, it might run uh, into a practice that has been uh, used in the past where local governments gave certain conditions to investors to attract them to their region and they would confirm these conditions in so-called red letterhead documents. The fact, the fact remains that these advantages granted to foreign invested companies are in fact affecting fair competition and uh, the question now is in to what extent local governments can do this uh, and whether this article and the foreign investment law will eventually back up protection uh, of foreign investment with respect to, to the uh, conditions set and the favorable conditions set in these red letterheads documents. This remains to be seen. Uh, and is unclear and we can only find that out in a later stage when the foreign investment law is taking effect and when foreign parties might eventually draw upon certain rights in the red letterhead documents and invoke the foreign investment law to enforce these. Let's talk now on the next subject on uh, uh, on this webinar, which is the protection of foreign investment. Uh, I would like to discuss three parts. First, the asset protection itself, where it is uh, regulated and what it might imply. Then an analysis uh, 
between the new law, the new foreign investment law, and the old laws with respect to IP protection, and then uh, standardizing management uh, clauses uh, in the foreign investment law. Let's first deal with the asset protection. I think one of the important articles in the foreign investment law is Article 20 and 22. Uh, it is stating a prohibition of expropriation and forced technology transfers. Uh, this is a part of the foreign investment law that was new or that is new with respect to the 2015 version. And it is to clarify Chinese position that government departments and officials cannot use administrative means for forced technology transfers. This is quite an important article also uh, for China in order to defend itself against accusations by the EU and eventually also by the US um, that there are uh, policies in place in China that forces technology transfer and that IP and also trade seekers are insufficiently protected. By now putting these clauses into the foreign investment law and I talk about article 20 and 22 it is very clear that these rules can refute accusations of compulsory technology transfer practices in China. Whether, at least on paper, it is clear that China will not uh, endorse nor promulgate such practices, it remains to be seen how in practice and then especially in the lower uh, government and the lower reg of the regions in China, this forced technology transfer in practice or the unfair treatment uh, of foreign investment is still not affected. Um, this, uh, however, uh, also remains to be seen uh, and uh, will be uh, dealt with uh, in maybe webinars later on when you would uh, start to evaluate the foreign investment law. Let's make an analysis between the old laws or the trilogy, that means the trilogy is the uh, Holy Foreign Owned Enterprise uh, law, the joint venture laws on the one hand and the foreign investment law on IP protection on the other. In the old laws it was saying that in the contract law, for instance, that contracts that illegally monopolize technology or hinder technology, technological development are invalid. This is in fact a clause that China has put in the contract law to um, prevent foreign parties to monopolize technology in the Chinese market. So the contract law in the past, in this case Article 239, uh, stated that such contracts that illegally monopolize, monopolize technology would be invalid. Also, in the old laws there were six circumstances of invalid contracts for illegal monopolization in the Supreme Court on trial of disputes involving technical contracts. Um, uh, uh, Article 10 and uh, in the technology import export regulations it was stated that technology the technology assigneur shall not prohibit the assignee to make improvements and finally of almost finally in the joint venture law article 43 it was indicated that technology importers are entitled and it, technology importers are often Chinese companies, they are entitled to use technology after the expiration of the technology transfer agreements. And finally, in Article 30 of the Foreign Trade Law, 
the state council could take measures for unfair license conditions. So these are the laws that were in place or are still in place before the 2020 foreign investment law will come into effect. So these uh, old regulations are very much to protect China from misuse of foreign investors of technology. Now, the new uh, foreign investment law uh, takes a different approach and the principle there is that the state shall protect intellectual property of foreign investors and foreign invested enterprises as well as the legitimate rights and relevant right holders of intellectual property rights. So it looks like the law is more open for the protection of foreign investment. In Article 22 of the Foreign Investment Law, it is indicated that there is a prohibi prohibition of administrative agencies and personnel to force technology transfer. So you can see that the gist of the 2019, I said, I said 2020 a few, few, uh, a few minutes ago, but I mean the 2019 Foreign Investment Law, is to give more force also in the regulatory itself to protect technology from foreign investors. While in the old laws it is, and I call it old laws, the, the question is whether all these laws will be eventually changed uh, and that remains to be seen. The old laws were more to protect the Chinese domestic companies against misuse of technology transfer terms or license agreements. This is a big change, I think, in the focus. It looks like the Chinese market has become more mature and that the technology already acquired by the Chinese parties is sufficiently strong for a level playing field with foreign companies. And now the foreign companies, in order to make foreign investments and bring new innovative technologies to China, need to be more protective by the, protected by the foreign investment law uh, uh, in order to make these uh, future investments for China to innovate. Then, uh, this, this was an important part to uh, summarize because this has been the core of many discussions to what extent the foreign investment law really intends to uh, protect foreign investment and also foreign, invest, uh, foreign uh, intellectual property. And at least on the base, on the face of the law itself and the specific regulations and clauses in the law, it seems to be the case. Then I will come to standardizing management uh, of the authorities. So here in Article 23 of the Foreign Investment Law, it is indicated that administrative authorities should keep confidential the trade secrets of foreign investors and foreign invested enterprises that come to the knowledge in the course of performing its duties. In the past, a lot of registrations of um, license agreements and certain technologies for importing of certain goods had to be disclosed in order to get approval. The question was always whether this know-how would remain within the Chinese government or could be used eventually or disclosed uh, in the market for other means. Uh, and there were indeed uh, worries that this disclosed, this disclosed information was not safe. So in Article 23 it is clear that at least on paper and each time I will say on paper because it remains to be seen to what extent in practice this will uh, have effect. The administrative authorities will keep confidential the trade seekers of foreign investors that come to their knowledge. Also uh, in Article 24 
uh, it is stated that in formulating normative documents concerning foreign investment, the people's governments at all levels should not impair foreign investment legal rights and interests or increase their obligations later on. Uh, Article 25 will say that local people's governments on all, level, all levels uh, shall honor policy commitments. And on Article 26, the state shall establish a complaint mechanism for foreign investment. In all these articles, 22, 23, uh, sorry, 23, 24, 25, 26, the uh, foreign investors uh, can rely upon a certain normative behavior of the government agencies when making uh, their um, administ when complying to administrative duties in the uh, foreign investment uh, law. Um, and there should be a complaint mechanism for foreign funded enterprises so that f problems encountered by foreign, invent foreign funded enterprises or their investors uh, can uh, be addressed. Then, upcoming changes in practice. First, the uh, replacement of the law trilogy, that means the old foreign investment laws. That will be one of the subjects to discuss. Then the implications for var um, variable in interest enterprises. Uh, then I would like to deal with uh, the, issue, the issues addressed in the foreign investment law on the remittance of foreign exchange in financial implications and certain uncertainties. First, the replacement of the old investment, foreign investment laws. As I say, there is the Holy Foreign Armed Enterprise Law, the Equity Joint Venture Law, the contractual, the contractual Joint Venture Law. All these laws will be abolished and you will have the company law the company law is not abolished and that means that foreign invested enterprises should eventually be reorganized in order to comply with the company law. So I will quickly deal with a few items in these specific laws that might eventually going to be changed in the foreign invested enterprises in order to comply with the foreign investment law and the company law. So. The decision making in the company law is always the shareholders meeting. In the foreign investment laws up to date, this varies. In the equity joint venture and the contractual joint venture, the highest decision making body is not the shareholders meeting, but is the board of directors or the joint management committee. This is going to be changed. Uh, in the coming five years, uh, at least the coming five years from the 1st of January 2020. So the board of directors term in the company law is three years, but in the equity joint venture was four years. Uh, so this is going to be changed. Then the legal representative of uh, the companies uh, is in almost any uh, yeah, it's in all uh, scenarios the chairman of the board, um, but uh, and that is also going to be the case in the company law. So as long as you the, the chairman is the legal rep, nothing is going to change. But um, uh, uh, this issue has probably to be addressed in the Articles of Association to make it more precise, as the. Foreign, uh, of the Holy Foreign Owned Enterprise Law had an executive director uh, and a general manager. And this might also be the same in the company law, but it might not be the same in the equity joint venture law and the contractually joint venture law. So, so we don't expect much problems here. The uh, transfer of equity, uh, that means the registered capital, uh, in fact, in the 
wholly foreign owned enterprise or the equity or contractually joint venture. This should uh, eventually uh, in the company law uh, can only be done by majority. But in the contractual joint venture and the equity joint venture law and the wholly foreign owned enterprise law, uh, it might require unanimous consent or and approval from the competent, competent authorities. Uh, this has to be changed and it's a little bit unclear whether approval will still be required in the uh, coming uh, into existence of the foreign investment law. So this has uh, not been completely clear uh, at the moment and we have to wait to what extent implementing rules are going to address this issue in more detail. Then there are some changes in the statutory reserve funds which I will not address but you can find on the sheets. So what are the implications for the foreign invested, sorry, the var var variable interest enterprise? It is, uh, I guess everybody will know the V structure, uh, also known as the agreement control or contractual arrangement, which refers to, a, to the use of a series of agreements uh, in order to control uh, a company even though you will not have as a foreign investor uh, legal ownership of the company. It was initially, initially designated to circumvent the restrictions imposed on foreign investors uh, regarding the market access especially in uh, uh, internet companies. The uh, foreign investment law uh, does not define uh, variable interest uh, enterprises uh, at all. Uh, but there is a catch-all clause stating that, uh, the clo that the law will cover also investment from foreign investors by other means than uh, investment in Chinese companies or setting up new companies or doing uh, projects and that the administrative uh, uh, that eventually the administration that means the state council might uh, define a V structure as a foreign investment structure and in that time if that will happen this will have quite some implications because uh, if there is a V structure in which a foreign investor has full control on a company that is active in a uh, business that is on the negative list. That means that at that time that business is uh, illegally operating in China and should be stopped. So uh, given the interest at stake, um, I think the foreign investment law didn't want to deal with uh, this issue in detail. Maybe also because the law was promulgated so fast by the National People's Congress that there was no time to detail all the implications uh, and therefore it was kept uh, vague or it was in this case uh, not addressed clearly uh, at all. Then let's go to the financial implications of the foreign investment uh, law for foreign investment enterprises. So foreign investment enterprise might, might raise now through public issuance of securities such as stock and corporate bonds and other forms in accordance to the law, uh, all kinds of uh, funds. Uh, it's in Article 17. The, uh, the uh, foreign investment law does not set a cap on the minimum percentage in the foreign investment law to be applicable uh, and that I mean minimum percentage of the registered capital while the equity joint venture and contractual joint venture would uh, in only come into effect if a foreign party would have at least 25 percent of the registered capital and in article 21 it is stating that uh, there should be free foreign exchange remittance 
That means the foreign investors may freely remit into or out of China in RMB or other currency their capital contributions, profits, capital gains, income from asset disposal, intellectual property royalties and lawfully acquired compensation, indemnity or liquidation income. This looks like uh, there is a codification of all the possible uh, financial uh, income uh, sources that eventually might lead to uh, payment uh, into or outside of China. In the earlier laws, that means again in the trilogy, the foreign investors might remit uh, legitimate profits earned from FIEs uh, and other legitimate income and funds obtained after liquidation, but it was not as broadly defined as it is now in the foreign investment law. And net profits received by the joint venture after fulfilling legal obligations might have been remitted in accordance to foreign exchange control. So in the older laws, uh, there were very clear regulations stating that remittance could only be done in accordance with foreign exchange controls. But in the new uh, foreign investment law, uh, there is no very strict reference to foreign exchange controls anymore. And um, uh, this is just a point of note in order to make uh, the difference between the old laws and the new foreign investment law more clear. Also the question is whether the foreign loan quotas of the foreign investment enterprises that are now in the system uh, and also indicated in the equity joint venture law will still apply. As you might know and you find it also in the sheet financial implications. The foreign loan quota is related to the total investment and there are minimum registered capital uh, requirements. So here the question is whether these uh, laws and whether these regulations and whether the investment gap model will still apply in the abolishment, after the abolishment of the equity joint venture law, the wholly foreign owned enterprise law and the contractual joint venture law. This remains to be seen. However, um, most likely, uh, and uh, these, these old um, credit gap uh, models will uh, be abolished and replaced by uh, the new foreign loan quota system uh, that was introduced in January 2017. Also termed the macro prudential financial management system uh, that was introduced by the People's Bank of China. Uh, under this new system, 2017 system, a new complex formula was introduced to calculate the foreign debt quota which, uh, if you put it simply, can be kept as two times the company's net asset. Uh, this will be a more flexible uh, model uh, and uh, the only way eventually to increase the quota under the investment gap model is to increase the total investment amount relating to the registered capital or the registered capital. So under the new model, the balance ceiling would normally twice the net assets. So this formula will probably be uh, remain to be in place and it will be applicable to both the foreign investment enterprises and the non-foreign investment prices, enterprises. And that is exactly in line with the spirit of the equal treatment as laid down in the foreign investment law. Um, uncertainties. Uh, I will now address uncertainties uh, with respect to the impl implementation of the foreign investment law. First is the indirect investment. It's unclear whether indirect investment of foreign investment enterprises in China will be regulated 
by the foreign investment law or not. Uh, so uh, whether the foreign investment enterprise who will eventually take a stake in a Chinese company does not mean that the stake in the Chinese company is considered and the Chinese company itself that has a foreign investment enterprise of a domestic foreign invented, invested enterprise is covered by the foreign investment law or not. Secondly, the investing of newly built projects in China. It's unclear what the definition of newly built projects in China exactly is. What is covered and what is not covered. A third unclarity is whether company structures that are going to be incorporated in this year are having to anticipate on the foreign investment law and if you for instance set up a joint venture can you set it up under the company law or should you still do it under the equity joint venture law that means you will only have the highest decision making body being the uh, board of directors and not the shareholders meeting uh, can you anticipate already on the entering into force of the foreign investment law by 2020 and adapt a set of articles of association in which the uh, in which the shareholders meeting is the higher and highest uh, decision making uh, body within a equity joint venture uh, and there are financial uncertainties uncertainties for instance, it remains unclear whether and how foreign investors, invest enterprises can apply for foreign loans in future and which principles will apply. As said, probably the MP financial management system. And there is an unclarity on how statutory reserve funds are established. Then I would like to come to the conclusion. Uh, of this uh, webinar on foreign investment on the foreign investment law first the foreign investment law indeed is the new fundamental law regulating foreign investment but it is predominantly still a policy document and a series of implementation regulations and guidelines are expected and needed in order to clarify uh, uh, the details on how this law is implemented and will work out in practice in the coming months and years. So secondly, the matter involving ver variable interest enterprises is not addressed in the final version. And it's clear that the uh, foreign investment law didn't want to rock the boat on the V subject and it has to be seen to what extent additional regulations and policies will deal with this matter. It should have been maybe regulated and made clear that actual control is eventually also covered by the foreign investment law but uh, in this case uh, the foreign investment law has kept it into uh, unclear waters. It's also the most flexible you can do of course but uh, it remains uh, that the V-structure's position in the legal foreign invested framework is not clear. Then uh, there are expected extensive national security provisions to leave the decision deciding power with the government and more detailed uh, implementing regulatory is expected. Uh, one point that I did not make here is that this issue has been addressed in Article 35 that states that the state shall establish a security review mechanism for foreign investment to review foreign investment affecting or likely to affect national security. So this regime shall come, is partially also in old laws in place, what is interesting is that the foreign investment law will say that a decision on security review shall be made according to law, but it is final, so it cannot be challenged and has to be digested by the foreign investor. 
Um, fourth point is that the negative list remains applicable but industries outside the negative list can call on an increased legal framework to insist on national and anti-discriminatory treatment, which is a good point. Foreign investment enterprises should adjust their charter documents, their organizational form, their organization structure and other matters after the release of the implementation regulations and measures. That means in almost all cases the uh, foreign invested enterprises that are now in existence in China shall have to adapt their articles of association and they have five years to do that. Then the enforcement of national treatment principle in practice is eventually a key evaluator. You know, on the one hand, the Chinese laws and the protection of rights in these laws are maybe better clarified. However, how local governments will implement and deal with unfair practices and how courts will sanction such practices are still to be seen. And this is a completely different element in this whole uh, this whole level playing field. You can put matters on paper, but enforcement is an important other part. And people who are often who are long time active in China know that law and practice can be two different things. And then finally, uh, I would like to draw attention to Article 40 of the Foreign Investment Law. Article 40 is saying that where a country or a region takes any discriminatory, prohibitive, restrictive or similar measures against the People's Republic of China in terms of investment, the People's Republic of China may take corresponding measures against the said country or region in line of, in line of the actual conditions. This will in fact imply that, uh, that the Chinese government can treat uh, certain industries in China more restrictive if certain industries are treated restrictive in uh, a foreign country. Uh, this might be very actual if you look at the recent developments with respect to Huawei in 5G tendering. Uh, it would imply that if, for instance, Huawei would not be allowed in tenders for 5G implementation in uh, infrastructures that the companies of uh, that specific country might also be uh, refused in tendering of uh, uh, similar projects in China. And that might have a big impact in future, not only maybe uh, in the case of uh, Huawei and 5G tendering, but it might apply in all different industries where China can use the access to the Chinese market in order to have uh, a trade policy and investment policy with respect to specific countries in the EU, in this case, uh, because we are having this webinar in the EU uh, SME Center, but also in the US, uh, and that case-to-case uh, -case measures can be taken on the basis of this Article 40 against uh, industries uh, that are not treated fairly in view of the Chinese uh, government, uh, uh, and that it will have implications for these foreign industries uh, in the Chinese market not something to forget easily and it will open a whole box of new uh, I think uh, trade disputes or can open a whole box of trade disputes and tensions in future. This is the end of uh, this uh, foreign investment law uh, webinar and I thank you for your attention.